What's going on, Imperials? It's Emperor Cubone here. Evolution is nothing new to the world of Pokémon. Hundreds of monsters change into new forms whenever they grow stronger. And oftentimes the transition is pretty smooth and can easily be tracked. However, there are some times where evolution is a rather big jump, causing drastic changes, and not that this is bad. In fact, I kind of like it. It reminds me of a Digimon line, digivolving from rookie to champion. And even then, there are usually reasons for such a big shift, such as the Magikarp evolution being based on Japanese legend. But there are other times where such a radical deviation is just too much to rationalize. So, here are the top six Pokemon evolutions that make no sense. Number six, Remoraid. All right, let's get this one out of the way. There is a fish that turns into an octopus. But I can already hear what some people will say, but it does make sense because of the weapons angle. Yes, I realize that Remoraid is supposed to be a gun of some sort, and Octillery is much larger ordnance, and all this is very clear in their beta versions. However, they did not stay in their beta versions, and for whatever reason, maybe censorship or violence or something, they lost a lot of that in their official designs. Remoraid might look like a gun now if you kinda squint, maybe? But Octillery is just a plain-looking octopus with a big nostril. Although its name does at least guide you towards the high-grade weaponry on which it's supposedly based. Honestly, it'd probably be a lot cooler if it had stayed like a tank in the beta version, and again, maybe that couldn't have been the case without raising the game's rating or something, but with the previous designs, they probably could have gotten away with introducing the water-steel combination a lot earlier, so it's a shame that they lost their edge. But they did, and as a result, they created one of the most dissident lines in the entire Pokémon world. At this point, you might as well have a Goldeen turn into a Cramorant. Although I think if there had been some sort of RPG-style Barracuda middle evolution, it might have helped to bridge the gap, at least a little bit. Number 5. Togekiss Honestly, I was gonna put Rhyperior here because I just don't like that Pokémon at all and it's a disgrace to be tacked onto the end of a line of otherwise great Pokémon. However, I guess I could see how it could make a little sense given the Protector item, but while sitting around the evolutions late in the Sinnoh decks, I came across Togekiss, and it started to grate on me. Why exactly does this evolve from the previous stages? I understand that the colors of the spots carry over, and that's fine, maintaining some familiarity across a white background, but I'm more concerned about the shape here. Togekiss might kind of look like a bird or a plane or something, I don't know, but it's a massive offshoot from where we were going. If anything, it looks more like it should have been a middle stage evolution between Togepi and Togetic. Actually, that would have made a lot more sense. Some people say it's trying to keep the continuity of the egg theme that's been going on with the rest of the line, but I feel like that was the least important part of Togetic. I thought the main slant of Togetic was the fact that it was supposed to be some sort of angel. So if you ask me, Togetic evolving into a more angelic stage at the end would have been a much better way to cap off the line instead of rolling over it with a steamroller and then reinflating it. Honestly, that was probably the best chance we've had to get an overt angel Pokémon until probably some legendary someday. And not to say that Togekiss is bad to use or anything at all, because it is quite a powerful ally. But simply from a design aspect, or even from a biology standpoint, I can't help but feel that Togekiss is a step down from Togetic. Why would you go from hands and legs to no hands and just feet? And while I can appreciate their zeal for creating new evolutions, I feel like they should focus a little more on the stability between the stages so we don't end up with a bunch more wild departures like Rhyperior. Number 4. Runerigus I was a big fan of regional variants when they debuted in Alola, and I still love the concept, but I wasn't as awestruck with some of the choices for variants in the Gala region. I did, however, appreciate the fact that these new variants could evolve in completely new ways, even if the outcomes were mixed to say the least. But one that's probably pretty okay is Runerigus. Runerigus? I don't know how you actually say it, but it is certainly an interesting design idea. And despite the fact that it should probably be Rock-type instead of Ground-type, I don't really have a problem with it. Other than that it shouldn't be related to Yamask in any way. 
Yamask is one of the more disturbing Pokémon since it carries around its own face, or at least it used to. In the Gala region, it now has a chunk of rubble. At this point, I am forced to ask why we even call it Yamask, since it no longer has a mask, and if we can change its evolution, then surely a more appropriate name would be in order. But we didn't get a snowshrew either, so I digress. Apparently, the story goes that Yamask has been taken over by this engraved slab that evidently some ancient people left a bunch of behind, because how in the world did they curse all of the Yamask in the Gala region? But when it evolves, it gets completely absorbed by another malevolent spirit that is somehow represented by this horrific snake creature. But it's said that this ancient painting only received life after it absorbed a Yamask, so it couldn't have been the one behind the difference in the first place. And you can clearly see that the tailpiece is an exact match, so it has to form into the next one. And I doubt the tablets would only act as a transceiver to transmit back to one stationary spot. And the way that it evolves is just ludicrous, to the point that not only will they have a tough time being replicated anywhere else, but what, is the underside of the giant arch just painted with this snake monster? Basically, I just have a hard time with the method used for one powerful ancient evil overtaking another, when the seemingly stronger one reportedly can't even move. The previous stage could have been completely still, like Pharisee or something, or at the very least not been a Yamask because the lore here is tangled in all sorts of knots. But what else can you expect when you have so many shadowy limbs? Number 3. Petalil and Cottony To me, I have always had a tough time telling these Pokémon apart. Apparently that is sacrilege to some, but not all of us played competitive or cared about Prankster. So I would usually just forget about these along with Maractus and focus on the rest of the many grass types in Unova. But eventually one of them did get the fairy type to distinguish itself. However, you might be asking, how does any of this mean that their evolutions are off? Well, I'm calling it now, and I think that these two Pokémon had their evolutions swapped. That's right, we've seen other theories like this before in the past, with the likes of Venonat and Butterfree sharing so many characteristics it's hard not to draw a comparison. Not that I fully believe that, but I do think that something similar might have happened with Petalil and Cottony. Take a look and see if you agree since Cottony has orange eyes that are a little wider and a pure white face and delicate leaves for hands. Whereas Petalil has thinner, redder eyes with tiny little nubs on the side that I can only assume to be the closest thing it has to arms. So when you look at Lilligant, you can see that it too has the wider orange eyes with a white face and similar leaves for arms, whereas Whimsicott has the thinner eyes and the tiny stubby arms. So to me, Cottony shares more in common with Lilligant than Petalil ever did. But you might be asking, what about the fluffy cotton? Surely that means that they're supposed to be together. Well, I've thought of that too. And I believe that these grass types could have been trade evolutions just like Shelmet and Carablast. Those Pokémon share a unique relationship where they only evolve when traded with each other, swapping certain characteristics in the process. So if the armor can be switched between the bugs, couldn't the cotton swap over with these grass types? To me, there's simply too much in common between them all, and I believe it was their intention to have another special trade circumstance. Otherwise, wouldn't they just evolve through level up? But for whatever reason, at some point they opted out, and needed some other way to evolve them and gave them both the Sunstone instead, to maintain the connections. So it is a bit of a conspiracy theory, but I do think that it's got some weight, and that these Pokémon could have, and perhaps should have, swapped evolutions. Number 2, Dugtrio. I've talked before about how I don't really like Dugtrio, but it really is just proof that the original generation of Pokémon was not perfect. I don't hate on Diglett at all, it's actually pretty cool that there's a creature who's always underground. Just from that description alone, I'm sure that you could come up with at least three or four great ideas on how it could evolve. But instead, somebody had to rush out for their lunch break, and we got Dugtrio. How do we make it bigger? Eh, I don't know, just put a bunch of them together. Are you kidding? Again, this is not necessarily to say that multiplying an evolution is bad, because most of the time it can make sense. Gears, more swords, toxic mutations, or even an extra scoop of ice cream all have reasonable explanations for why they would multiply. But what made them think that moles deserved that treatment too? 
It's like they were taking a test and the Dugtrio designer copied the Magneton one without realizing that it was a completely different question. And then of course there's the Alolan versions that took the three individual hairs on Diglett and bought approximately all of the Rogaine they could find and made them have ridiculous 80s wigs that turned them into steel types? I wish that Alola had started the trend in Galar where regional forms could have their own new evolutions. Since then we could have finally gotten a real evolution for poor Diglett instead of the laziest use of the copy-paste function I've seen in years. Number 1. Glam Pearl The Hoenn region has a lot of great chains of evolution that you can see and appreciate. But if you ask me, the Pokémon whose possible evolutions make the least amount of sense has got to be Glam Pearl. Clam Pearl isn't that hard to figure out. As the name suggests, it's just sort of a regular clam with its head apparently being an attached pearl of some kind. Even though in the anime it showed that the pearls are completely different and removable. Anyway, it's actually a little unsettling to have a weird baby head poking out of this bivalve. But the strangest part of this Pokemon is its branched evolutions. Clam Pearl can turn into either Huntail or Gorbis. And while these sea serpents might have enough to loosely tie them together, what do they have to do with Clam Pearl? First of all, these evolved forms are a lot smaller than people think. Usually when you think of a sea serpent, it's like Gyarados or Dragonite, but at least their models are shown to be a lot shorter. That's not super relevant, just something of note. Although perhaps it's because their growth was stunted by being trapped in a shell for so long. I understand the deep sea tooth and the deep sea scale resulting in the toothy one and the scaly one, and it is incredibly cool that they can be seen as literal mirror images of each other so I don't have a problem with Huntail and Gorbis being related. But how do they possibly come from a tiny clam? It's a complete non sequitur, and the only possible thing I've ever heard to explain it is someone saying, uh, well, clam pearl kinda looks like fish eggs, maybe? But if you ask me, that's just grasping at straws. To me, it would have been more in line if clam pearl took the underwater valuables theme even further and evolved into a chest of sunken treasure. Once again, maybe even becoming a water steel type. Wouldn't that have been cool and made sense? And then the other two could have evolved from something like Tynamo, and then we could have just deleted Love Disc from the decks completely. In all honesty, I forget that these Pokemon are related all the time, because there's no reason for them to be. You can complain all you want about the methods that some Pokemon might use to evolve, or I've even heard discussions on the nuances of changing a crocodile into an alligator, but we have much bigger problems when a tiny clam that looks like it was drawn by a two-year-old has such wildly diverging end results based on giving it to someone else with a hold item. I think this is grounds for a whole new conspiracy theory on there being a middleman the trades actually go through, and he's just flat out replacing them to send them to the other side. Maybe those items are more valuable than we know? I'm not sure. Or... Honestly, maybe these were supposed to be a common pair like they seemed to enjoy making so much in Gen 3. And then at the last second they realized, oh, we forgot to include any trade evolutions in the Gen 3 roster and quickly threw in an unrelated Pokemon that had been scrapped. I don't guess we'll ever know, but if you ask me, the Clam Pearl conundrum should go on to stump Pokemon scientists for years to come because some wearable shells are not nearly enough to connect them all and it was by far the most out of left field evolution I've seen in the series to date. And that includes Cosmog. So, those are the top six Pokemon evolutions that make no sense. Which evolutions do you find the strangest? Let me know down in the comments. Also be sure to leave a like, share this video, and subscribe so that you too can become an Imperial today. And we'll see you around next time!